The Blacklist Season 9 ended last month. With a bittersweet ending, Remond has lost another companion in the finale. And yes, he was successful in avenging the death of Elizabeth Keane. I do to the person responsible. How dark is the blackness at the center of this hole in my heart? If you haven't watched this season yet, then don't worry, because this cine visit is going to tell you everything that happens in the Blacklist Season 9. So buckle up and enjoy this video. Reloading! The season starts after two years of death of Elizabeth Keane. The task force has been disbanded and Reddington is nowhere to be found. Demby has joined the FBI after listening to his conscience. He's been working undercover for six months to infiltrate a crime syndicate. This dangerous group is after microchips and they are recognized by a notable S tattoo on their hands. When Demby and his FBI partner meet up with members of the syndicate, things went south. Dembe's partner is dead, and Dembe himself ends up in the hospital with third-degree burns. Cooper visits Dembe in the hospital. He is no longer with the FBI, because he's Agnes Guardian now, the daughter of Elizabeth Keane. As for other task force members, Wrestler spends his time fixing old cars, while Aram ventures into the business of co-founding, a cybersecurity startup. Agent Alina is married and she no longer works in the field. To cash this syndicate, Dembe and Cooper needs Raymond's help, who is hiding in Havana with two female shamans. So to identify the culprits, Dembe asks Cooper to contact Raymond, because as Agnes Guardian, only he can reach Raymond. To stop this syndicate, Cooper gets back his old task force after convincing them. He also meets up with Raymond, who tells Cooper about the tattoo. The culprit turns out to be just one criminal, known as the Skinner. The moniker on his hand has been passed down to criminals fulfilling this role for centuries. Raymond knows former Skinner, and he returns to the States to assist the task force. Vincent, need a lift? Episode 2 Agent Zuma got out of the hospital to help the team. He advised Cooper that they needed the help of the senator. Cooper visited Senator Cynthia Panabaker. She was the bureaucrat who disbanded the task force, and if Reddington returned, it would end his immunity agreement. After some talking, she gave them access to their former facility, technology, and tactical teams if needed. The Crunt Skinner, whose name is Anderson, kidnapped a chief tech officer Chen and his family. The Skinner instructs Chen to go into his office and download the software for the microchips. Aram and Alina convince Chen to give Skinner fake software so they can track his location and rescue his family. Unfortunately, the Skinner didn't take the bait and he came to know their plan. Meanwhile, Red meets with Skinner's predecessor again. He suggests that Vincent invoke the charter to remove the current Skinner. Vincent explains that this can't be done without consulting his predecessor, Alberta. Vincent and Red find Alberta in a nursing home, and she agrees to invoke the charter. I'll be damned. Give me a kiss. A good one. Let's blow this popsicle stand. On the other side, Skinner shoots Chen's wife in the leg to convince Tembe, Ressler, and Alina to give up their plan. When all seems lost, Red shows up with Vincent and Alberta. The former Skinners vote the current one out. Anderson laughs them off, but his henchmen respect the organization and turn their guns on Anderson, shooting and killing him. Sometimes rules are meant to be broken. Later, the team regroups and each member has a trip on memory lane. The final scene shows Red getting an S tattoo, confirming that he will take Anderson's place as the new Skinner. In third episode, the task force learns of a new criminal group of religious extremists. Give it to me! The relic! Now! Please, this is not what God wants for your life. I doubt it. 
to solve this case, Reddington reunites with the blacklister to help the task force. The episode opens in Italy, with a group of religious extremists stealing a holy relic. Red tells Cooper that this group is known as the Suprema Priori Knighthood (SPK), a criminal group that steals and auctions off religious artifacts. Cooper briefs the task force and they begin their investigation. When Alina and Ressler confront a man suspected of wiring money, he ends up lighting himself on fire to escape. <coughs> to catch the members of SPK, Red attends an auction to meet with the leader. The leader is revealed to be Giovanni, as known as Wesco. He is Red's former mentor who stole money from him in season 6. Wesco explains that he conned the group into criminal activity, making them believe that he burns the artifacts as an offering. In the meantime, the SPK plot to blow up a church with explosives. Where Giovanni? He doesn't want this. Giovanni doesn't seem to know what he wants. When do you plan to detonate these? When the bishop raises the head of John the Baptist, will blast open the gates of heaven for all the world to see. Wrestler and Demby learn from the group's plan to blow up the church and steal the head of John the Baptist. Red convinces Wesco to talk the SPK down from setting off the bombs, but that plan quickly fails. Dembe helps Aram to get close enough to dismantle the IEDs, while Red reveals the truth about Wesco to the SPK members. I'm many things to many people. To Robert here, I'm a creditor who very much needs him alive. But when things get heated, Reddington's new companion, killed SPK members to save Vesco's life. Throughout this episode, Wrestler questions Tembe's loyalty to the FBI. To prove his loyalty, Tembe confronts Wesco and Red. He places Wesco under arrest, which didn't sit well with Red. Wrestler seems to be dealing with addiction issues again. Elena tells him that she knows he tried to fake his drug test and to clean up his act. In the end, Cooper finally agrees to let Red see Agnes. The pair meet for the first time in two years. Agnes remembers that the last time she saw Red was the day before her mother died. I remember you. We sailed boats together in Central Park. And we got fruit pops. In fourth episode, the task force tracks down a blacklister who uses extreme means to return what has been unfairly stolen. Episode 4 begins with Adam McHenry, the CEO of a company who is ambushed in his hotel room. A woman forces him to read a confession before throwing him out the window to his death. Dembe plays a red a visit. Red explains that Adam's death was the work of Michael, the avenging angel. She commits murder, extortion, and other crimes to return what has been unfairly stolen. Meanwhile, Cooper wakes up in the parking garage and can't remember how he got there. His wife tells him that her former lover, Doug Costa, has been shot dead. Cooper notices that a round is missing from his service weapon, so he seeks help from a friend to run a ballistic report. The task force discovers that Michael is choosing victims from an online prayer group. To catch her, Aram and Dembe finds where she has been hiding out. Her new victim is a wealthy man who bribed to get a first number on a heart transplant surgery list. From his selfish act, a steel worker, William Green, didn't receive a new heart. Michael kidnaps both of these men and intends to right the wrong by giving the wealthy man's heart to William Green. Red manages to get a hold of a Van Gogh painting, which he uses to find Michael. He kills Michael and has her heart given to Mr. Green. He also returns the painting to Ada, a 90-year-old Holocaust survivor. At the end of episode 4, Cooper finds out that the ballistics are matched with his gun. Hey. Honey, it's late. What time are you coming home? Soon. I'll be home soon. Did you hear anything? I mean, about the case? Do you have any idea what happened? They don't, but I do. Episode 5 begins with a mysterious death. A man driving a car suddenly started to suffer from a headache. Eventually, he crashes his car and his death looks like an accident. When Dembe visits Red, 
he informs Tembe about a special weapon. This weapon can kill people with high energy waves through walls and ceilings. Upon investigation, they find Dr. Benjamin T. Okara, the chief engineer of this secret project. The task force realizes that Akara stole the weapon and he is calling the five other engineers who helped him create the weapon. Using the three-word code, Aram is able to locate Akara's next target. Park and Tembe shows up to offer him protection, but he hits Park over the head and tries to run. Unfortunately, Akara kills him with his weapon's energy waves. Park is caught in the crossfire and Tembe has her rushed to the hospital. Later, the FBI catches Okara. Wrestler finally understands that Okara killed his colleagues because he wants the weapon destroyed. He calls it a weapon of mass suffering and doesn't want anyone to know about its making. Okara then triggers a bomb, killing himself and destroying the weapon in front of the FBI. Things take a dark turn in the personal lives of task force members. Cooper continues to try to find the truth about who killed Doug Costa. He has no memory of that incident. Upon questioning, he gives a fake alibi with help of his wife. Agent Alina lost her baby due to her field duty, which breaks her down with grief. On the other side, relations between Tembe and Reddington are stained. Red is not happy with Tembe's joining the FBI. Upon confrontation, Red tells him to choose a side. After he left, Tembe opens a box given to him by Reddington. Red instructed Tembe to open the gift after their working relationship is over. Episode 5 ends with Tembe finally opening the box with tears in his eyes. Episode 6 starts with Dr. Roberta Sand in a therapy session. Seems normal. The therapy ends with the client carrying out a murder. Red informs Cooper that Sand is a kind of therapist to the mob. Have a hundred times before, you take up your instrument and find the light. She helps criminals actualize their crimes and make them happen. Demby and Park track down the client and arrest him. After investigation, the team learns that Sand convinced the client with her therapy to commit murder. With help of the client, Task Force successfully arrests Dr. Sand. She tells them that her son Dante got in trouble in the past to keep him out of the jail. The mob boss blackmailed her for her services. So the task force is able to take the boss as well as Dante into custody. During this time, Red makes a shocking discovery. With help of Agnes, Red wonders whether Liz read the letter before shooting him or not. The letter which contains Reddington's true identity was meant for Liz, but only after his death. He checks for her fingerprints and it seems that the letter was given to her before the shooting. Filled with anger, Red saves Dr. Sand and her son from the FBI's custody. He requests that Sand work as his personal therapist on a remote island for a few months. Red tells her about his anger at finding out that his oldest friend betrayed him. As for Cooper, the mystery surrounding Coster's death only gets more complicated. He meets with his friend, Liu Solon, who believes Cooper is being framed for the murder. At the end of the episode, Cooper receives a phone call from someone blackmailing him for tempering with evidence. What do you want? So much. And with what I know about you and the murder of Doug Coster, I'm confident you're going to give it. Episode 7 mostly revolves around Agent Ressler. It depicts the aftermath of that night when Liz was shot. But these scenes are shown in flashbacks through Ressler's eyes. On that night, after Liz was shot, Ressler hijacked a car in pursuit of Red and crashed his car. He waked up in a hospital and after being discharged, he traveled to a small town where he rents a model room. Emotionally distressed and losing all hope, he gets addicted to painkillers. His condition gets worsened during his stay and he was even robbed by some thugs. But his interaction with the owner and her son brings him new hope. He helped the lady and her son from an abusive cop. In the present day, on Elizabeth's two-year death anniversary, Ressler visits her grave for the first time. At Liz's grave, 
Ressler fills her in on everything that has been happening with him and the task force. Breaking into tears, he tells Liz the story of the model lady and her son in that small town. Well, that's exactly what I was doing for a while. After everything fell apart. After I fell apart. Did I mention I fell apart? Yeah. Episode 8 begins with Dr. Razmik Maya, who injects a professional athlete with a drug that ends up killing him. Red tells Cooper that Maya was involved with the Boswell Syndicate, a major betting group. This syndicate orders doctor to kill professional athletes for their own gain. However, when Red and Demby visit the Boswell Syndicate, they learn that the group got ties with Mia years ago. Alina and Wrestler go to talk to the victim's parents and there they meet Walker Burgos. He's a close friend of the family who makes sports apparel. Meyer kidnaps and kills a journalist who has been gathering information on him. Park and Wrestler weren't able to save her, but Aram recovers a flash drive that she swallowed. They learn that Meyer's next target is likely a professional runner, Annie Bolin. However, it is revealed that Burgess was working with Maya. Burgess killed Maya to cover his tracks and tries to kill Annie as well. Luckily, he's apprehended by Aram and Park. Red meets with Demby and inquires about the letter. Demby admits that he did give Liz the letter against Red's instructions. Red reveals that the man who killed Liz was at a coffee shop where Demby gave her the letter. Red blames Demby for being so distracted that he couldn't see the danger and protect Liz. Cooper is getting more involved in the murder mystery. He came to know that he was drugged on the night of Coster's murder. Through surveillance footage, it is shown that it was the bartender who drugged Cooper. To his surprise, the bartender is also murdered. The blackmailer tells Cooper that now he has the blood of two men on his hands. Congratulations, Harold. Now you have the blood of two men on your hands. The ninth episode opens with Reddington telling Marvin Jared about Demby's betrayal. But Jared didn't agree with Red and tells him about the murder of three important members of his empire. The only thing worse is the fact that I am the first one telling you this. Hess was hit on Tuesday. You're out of touch. You need to get your ducks in a row, Raymond. Reddington asks the help of a bureau which finds the next target of that unknown enemy. This target is Reginald Lawyer, a man working for Raymond. Demby and Dressler save him. Soon Demby realizes who this enemy is. This isn't about hurting Raymond. This is about killing me. In a flashback, it is shown that after Keane's death, Reddington was unable to run his empire. Eventually, Demby stopped up and ordered a hit on Reddington's enemy, Buckman Baptist. However, unknown to Demby, it was Buckman's son in the car. Buckman survives the hit while his son was killed. Now he's out to get Demby. It was the incident that forced him to join the FBI. In the present day, he kidnaps Demby's daughter, Isabella. Demby calls Buckman and promises to get him the names of Reddington's top three lieutenants in exchange for his daughter's safety. Daniel died because you wanted his business. I can help you get some of that. He finds Jared and pulls a gun on him, asking for the names of Red's top three lieutenants to save Isabella. Over the phone, Red tells Jared to give him the names. Demby then goes to meet Baptist and save his daughter. But when Baptists try to kill Demby and his daughter, Weecher infiltrates and saves them both. To solve Keane's death, Aram plotted everywhere when Dyke, the murderer of Elizabeth Keane, went on the day she died. He gives this information to Red, who realizes that Van Dyke didn't follow Demby or Keane. I mean, I'm as big a conspiracy theorist as the next guy, but this sounds like some classic third man stuff. This leads him to the conclusion that someone must have told Van Dyke about Keane's location. Red finally apologizes for abandoning Tembe and informs him that they need to work together to figure out who tipped Wendike about Liz. We can't be fighting each other when we have a real enemy to fight, to find. But someone led Elizabeth's killer to her that night, and we need to work together. In episode 10, Reddington's trustworthy employee, Hedy, is returned. She is captured in an FBI raid while smuggling soybeans. Raymond! 
We got trouble. Red orders Marvin to try to get Hedy out of prison. Meanwhile, Red brings a new blacklister known as Arcane Wireless. It is a black market operating system that cannot be tapped or traced by law enforcement. It is run by a person named The Seer. He made a new deal with a human trafficker who is entrusted in this operating system. Upon learning this deal, Cooper sends Aram to gather more information. Aram meets her former mentor at the bureau, FJ Powell, to know more about the phone. Without FJ's consent, Aram takes a phone with him, which is evidence from a suspect. He re-examines the phone and came to know that some information has been missed by his former mentor. Wrestler and Dembe interrogate the suspect who gives them a name. When they go to catch that person, they find that Seer has abducted him before they arrive. From surveillance footage, they identify the Seer who previously worked for a syndicate. Through his connections, Red locates the Seer with help of his former boss. On the other hand, Aram confronts FJ and accuses him of being a traitor. In this argument, FJ reveals everything about the Arcane Network to Aram. As Dembi and Wrestler are ready to arrest the Seer, Aram rushes to tell Cooper that the Seer is actually a deep undercover FBI agent. He informs Cooper that the Arcane Network belongs to the FBI to track criminals. But it is too late because the task force arrested the Seer and the whole operation of the FBI failed. Hedy is saved after Marvin struck a deal not to leak any information about the FBI's Arcane Wireless Network. What do you know about the Arcane Wireless Network? Nothing. To spread the word to every drug runner, gangster, and con man who are still in possession is going to be when you set my client free. The 11th episode centers on Agent Alina and her past. After Keen's death, a depressed Agent Alina was recruited by Richer to assassinate horrible people for the government. She tells the task force about her life as an assassin for hire during the two-year time. Now the same organization running by Richer wants her back. Known as the Conglomerate, this organization of contract killers previously worked under government contracts but are now working for whoever can pay them. Cooper tells Park to accept the job so they can shut the whole thing down. She is successful in getting a meeting with the conglomerate leaders. After a successful meeting, Park bids Richard goodbye, allowing the task force to come in to make arrests. But Richard escapes and ends up in Park's apartment where he takes her husband hostage. Park brutally kills him in front of her husband and finally tells him everything about her including Reddington. On the other side, Reddington has Aram investigate Von Dyke's laptop to find any clues. They find that somehow he slipped a tracking device on Liz that day. Red finds out the final location of the tracker was the cemetery Liz is buried in. They realize they must exhume Liz's body to find it. The twelfth episode focuses on a new blacklister named The Chairman. He runs a stock market for criminals called The Night Market. The episode begins with The Chairman punishing three business associates. <laughs> he cuts their fingers and sends a photo to every investor of Night Market. Red's company is part of The Night Market, so he warned the task force about The Chairman and shows them the picture. No one but the chairman knows which investors and companies are involved. Reddington points out such a company whose black market stocks went up after getting caught in a scandal. So the task force starts its investigation with this group. Drayton Abazi is a ruthless leader of this group who is tracked by the task force. He lives in a suite along with his girlfriend Felicia and her daughter. Aram places a bug underneath the table in the suite. Thanks to Aram's undercover work, the team discovers that Abazi made Felicia set up a meeting with gaming enforcement's agents. Dembi and Wrestler go to alert the agents, showing up right as the hit is about to take place. But Dembi shoots the sniper and arrests Felicia, who is willing to talk to save her daughter. With help of her, they arrest Abazi and ask him about Chairman's hideout. To draw out the chairman, Cooper lies to the media, saying that they are now investigating the night market so that its stocks drop. But the chairman knows it's a trap to crash the market, 
He calls a meeting with the heads of all the companies in the black market, including Red. Reddington reveals the meeting's location to the task force, leading to the chairman's arrest. Cooper receives a call from the blackmailer who wants a grad student, Andrew Kennison, go away by giving him a new identity. Cooper finds Andrew and tells him his life is in danger and he must go into witness protection. Cooper also gets a court order to exhume Keane's body to find the tracker. They succeed in finding it. The tracker is extremely advanced and is only activated when it encounters digestive enzymes. They couldn't find anything else but to continue their investigation on it. Episode 13 opens with a love scene between a woman and a US ambassador. He tells her to choke him, which she did, to the point where he is killed. Reddington informs Cooper about Ambassador Warren's murder by an escort. Upon investigation, they find the company, Genuine Models. Then scene cut to the man named Gordon Graham, sitting next to the same woman who killed Warren at the start. They find another congressman murdered in a house by the escort woman. They find the hair at the crime scene. Upon DNA test, they find a potential suspect, but it proves to be a dead end. Meanwhile, Aram found a front of Genuine Models company. Through that front, they save a potential victim amid the choking by the same woman. Aram and Park break in to save the person, with Aram pushing the woman off him. It is revealed that the woman is in fact a robot. Demby and Ressler go to the company to investigate the matter. The CEO of Genuine Models informs them about the Chrissy robot which is involved in all these murders. He tells them that the company has suspended all sales of the Chrissy model and they are trying to figure out why their robots malfunction. Back at the base, Aram examines one of the Chrissy robots and discovers that it was hacked to kill. He also identifies the location of the hacker which is none other than Gordon Graham. Gordon is aware that he's been caught and escapes with a woman who is also a Chrissy robot. Gordon is a rich tech guy who believes his relationship with his robot is real. Demby and Ressler have him cornered on the road. He reveals he had those men killed for what they did to their robots. Refusing to be separated from his Chrissy, he drives off the cliff, thus killing himself. Cooper and Liu find a new lead to catch the blackmailer. This lead is the bartender's friend who tells them about a detective who forced the bartender to drug Cooper. Cooper tells Liu that they must find this detective to uncover the whole conspiracy. In this episode, Red unites with his old flame at a funeral of their mutual friend. They both came with a plan to snatch a necklace from the widow who poisoned their friend. I think you should take this. <sighs> The 14th episode opens with an abduction of a young woman called Sheila. She is a Senator Panabaker's daughter-in-law. When found, Sheila is in a medically induced coma with heart damage. Panabaker wants Red and the task force to find the person who did this to her daughter-in-law. The person responsible for this is Eva Mason and her friend Ben Stark. They have a new target. A little girl, Sarah, who is suffering from seizures. They choose their targets from a fundraising organization for families whose children have serious health issues. Sheila and her daughter, Charlotte, were also in this organization because Charlotte has a heart condition. The task force discovers that Sarah and her mother would be the next target, so they rushed to the hospital to save them. Eva tries to abduct Sarah's mother, but she didn't succeed. From the anesthesia gun used by Eva, Ressler and Dembe locate their hospital and arrest Ben Stark. Panabaker asks Red to use his methods to gain information from Ben Stark. She eventually reveals that the kidnapped murderers, including Sheila, all have Munchausen syndrome. This means they have been intentionally making their children sick. Ressler and Demby leave for Mary and Sarah, who have escaped from the hospital. Eva has tracked Mary and Sarah to the hotel, with the task force close behind. Eva tells Sarah about her illness and tries to shoot Mary, but Sarah accidentally shoots Eva after finding a gun in her mother's purse. As for Reddington, he gains information about the tracker. It's a capsule designed to send GPS coordinates and monitor medication released in the body. After further digging, Red finds the developer, who is Andrew Kennison. Prototype of something I saw last year. 
We were going to initiate a pilot program with some of my mood disorder patients. In 15th episode, a lot of things happened to uncover the mystery behind Keen's death. After learning about Andrew, Reddington tries to find him, but he's unable to do so. He seeks help from the task force and tells them everything about the tracker and Andrew. Upon learning that, Cooper is visibly distraught, because now he knows the person who killed Elizabeth and blackmailed him is the same man. Cooper assigns Demby and Ressler to find Andrew. Ressler and Demby are informed Andrew is in the witness protection program on the orders of Deputy Director Harold Cooper. They are shocked and tell the rest of the task force what they found out. Aram then overhears Cooper's confession about everything to Reddington. Red is angry and demands to speak to Andrew, otherwise he will use his methods. Cooper then tells the rest of the task force the truth. They are all in disbelief but support their boss in whatever he may want to do. He calls Panna Baker and will accept the consequences of his actions. Red finds a way to get to Andrew by kidnapping him from the safe house. On his private plane, Red asks him about the tracker. He tells Reddington that he gave a pill tracker to a cop he met at a business forum several years ago. The man's name is Detective Reginald Reggie Cole from NYPD. Cooper is arrested for his crimes, but he tells the task force to arrest Cole. After running a reverse voice modification program on the voice recording of Cole, they locate him. Reginald Cole is working as a corrupt private investigator. He receives a call from an unknown person and after that call, he escapes from his office after burning all evidence. As Reggie is on the run, the task force arrest him before Red can get to him. Panna Baker visits Cooper and tells him bad news about his possible indictment. Just then, the task force brings Reggie in and Panna Baker tells Ressler that it's on him to make sure their suspect talks to save Cooper. Red comes to the post office and demands that Reggie should be handed over to him. But Panna Baker refuses because anything from Reddington is not admissible to the court. Meanwhile, Reggie's lawyer Tyson shows up and gets his client free. While waiting for Reggie and Tyson to exit the building, Red tells Marvin that the pair is going to be killed by the mastermind. And the same happens when both Reggie and his lawyer are gunned down in the street. In this episode, Red and Ouija sneak into Reginald Cole's office and find a special key to Mount Bastion. It is a secret, impregnable underground storage facility for notorious criminals. To find who is behind Elizabeth's death, Red needs to break into that facility where he has his own vault. Red visits the creator and engineer of the facility, Helen Mahi, who is in hiding after the cargo arms deal goes wrong. Red proposes a deal. He will get the FBI off her back if she gets him to the Keys vault. Cooper is waiting for his indictment. He pleads not guilty, but cannot afford a bail set for him. Red pays the bail, allowing Cooper to return home, but he is not allowed to work with the task force. In his absence, Aram is the new boss of the task force. Red seeks help from the task force to help Helen instead of arresting her, but Aram refuses to let her go because she is an extremist and a terrorist. Red makes a deal with her to provide a new identity in exchange for her help in breaking into the vault. So they devise a plan to go into Mount Bastion, Wrestler and Park disguise as the guards, and they shut off the water valve. It triggers a reboot of the entire facility and gives Reddington and Dembe enough time to find something. In the mystery vault, Red finds a collection of DVDs that he created for Les with instructions on how to run his empire. But these were supposedly locked up in a safe with the only people who had access to it being Red and Liz. After this mission, Red tells Helen to get prepared for a new life. But Aram has other plans and he has her arrested for terrorist activities. But Reddington uses his methods to save Helen from being arrested. Reddington also blackmails Panna Baker to buy some more time for Harold Cooper. There's a line I have studiously avoided crossing in my career until now. From a woman you brought to me two weeks ago to interrogate for information. You recorded that? I wonder how that recording would play for your Judiciary Committee. The 17th episode begins with the kidnapping of Aram by some men working for El Conejo Marquez. 
he's taken before Marcus, who claims Aram hacked his server. I am Don Francisco Luis Marquez, El Conejo, to my best friends. And you stole from me. Now you're going to pay me back with your life. He shows Aram the code, which has his name in it. Aram offers his help by looking through the code. Soon he realizes someone used his code and weaponized it against Marcus. Just then, Marcus receives a call from a blackmailer who will exchange the goods for half a million dollars. Team and Red try their best to find Aram. For this, they talk to the Script Brothers, who created Marcus's server. The brothers get into Marcus's system and tracks Aram's location. The FBI rescues Aram but Marcus escapes. Marcus brings the money to the blackmailer which is none other than his own son, Antonio. He's angry and he's never been included in the family business because his father has never seen him as worthy. Angry at his son's deception, Marcus shoots at Antonio, but Aram saves him. The FBI arrest Marcus and his men. Aram destroys his own code so that nobody can weaponize it in the future. On the other hand, Red interrogates his own man who was in charge of DVDs. He was instructed to give these DVDs to Elizabeth only after Reddington's death, but the man didn't betray him, which baffles Reddington. After watching DVDs for some time, Red realizes how the DVDs were taken. The safe we see in this room is in the original safe that Red purchased. It was replaced with a perfect replica, so Weecha brings in the safe maker who reveals that the replica was made at Reddington's request. He tells them about the woman who has read bank account information. The woman he describes is Mr. Kaplan. I had no idea you were going to be robbed. You say you made the duplicate for me. A woman. She came to me and she said she was your representative. I remember glasses. She wasn't very tall. I do remember one other thing. In 18th episode, the task force captures a drug lord who tried to kill a pharmaceutical company's CEO. Red informs Cooper about Laszlo Jankowicz as the next blacklister. Having taken so much LSD himself, it left some permanent brain damage, causing him to think a pet line is following him around. Ressler tells the team he's obtained a search warrant for LaCroix's home. Cooper and Ressler will work on the LaCroix case, while the others focus on getting Laszlo. Meanwhile, Red visits Kaplan's sister, Maureen. He reveals that Kaplan may still be alive and asks Maureen if she had any type of contact with her sister. Maureen tells him she did not, but asks him to find Kaplan's associate and former lover, Clara Moore. Upon investigation, the task force learns that Avery worked for Laszlo's father in the past and left to sell Laszlo's product as a pharmaceutical drug. This enraged Laszlo and is why he attacked Avery. By using his resources, Red tracks down him in a motel. He goes and questions Avery about Laszlo's cleaner, which is Clara Moore. He tells Reddington that only Laszlo can contact her, so Red calls Laszlo and shoots Avery in front of him. To clean this mess, Laszlo calls Clara Moore. Reddington questioned her about Kaplan, but she denies everything. Wrestler and Cooper find that Reggie and Lekarix were running a successful scam. To find the truth, they started to dig deeper. Red calls Brimley to get the truth out of her. Brimley tells him that she didn't know about Kaplan's return until two days ago. She left Clara a note with instructions to meet at an abandoned building that night. Red calls Cooper, revealing the entire thing about Kaplan, and together they go to the building. Red sees Mr. Kaplan, clearly alive, from the window of the building. Weecha and her men decide to go in and retrieve Kaplan, but as they enter the building, they are ambushed and the building explodes. Weecha! Weecha! Episode 19 follows Aram as he fights with his inner demons. To fresh his mind, Aram takes a professional psychotherapy service using controlled substances. During this therapy, he experiences his worst nightmares. In these nightmares, Aram finds himself under attack along with his team members. All members are killed one by one by a man wearing a beer mask. 
This dream repeats several times until the masked man reveals himself. It is shown that this man is Aram's alter ego who held him responsible for Elizabeth's death, as well as Samar leaving him. Just when evil Aram is about to shoot, he is shot by Samar. She tells him none of that happened to Samar, Liz and Agnes is his fault. She tells him he has always been enough and Aram wakes up. From forensic reports, it is confirmed that it wasn't Kaplan but her sister Maureen. Wrestler and Cooper wants to interrogate the lawyer's wife, but she is killed before their arrival. They are able to catch the culprit. They also find a down payment from a Lebanese bank account on the hitman's phone. Cooper brings the account information to Red to see if he can identify the account. Red does because it's his own bank account. The payment for Mrs. LaCroix's assassin. It came from your account? It did. Episode 20 begins with criminals securing their finances with Harris Gramercy, the president of Calum Bank. This bank is an institution which is constantly on the move via an airplane. While Red hasn't touched his account in years, it was used for the murders of Reggie Cole and the Lacarikes. Red will need to get a hold of who last had access to that account, but Gramercy won't give that information up easily. To get that information, the task force can ground the plane. Wrestler disguises himself as an inspection officer and acted to recognize Reddington. The FBI arrests both Red and Gramercy. After failing to convince Gramercy to give the name, Reddington shoots him. Red refuses to get Gramercy's help until he hears a name. Finally giving in, Gramercy calls his people and tells Red the name Hedwig, Hedy Hawkins. Red and Weecha drives towards Hedy's home in Florida while Gramercy is dead. Demby attempts to contact Hedy and warns her about Reddington. Wrestler and Demby go to Hedy before Red and Weecha, but Red crashed into them and took Hedy with him. After some questioning, he tells Weecha to make it quick. She takes Hedy to the back room and a gunshot is heard. Red turns to Marvin and wants to deal with the aftermath of Gramercy's death. Back at the base, Agent Park finds something unexpected. While watching LaCroix's wedding video, we see a familiar face giving the best man speech. This person is none other than Marvin. While on the plane, with Marvin getting ready to leave, Red receives a call from Cooper. He tells Reddington the truth about Marvin. After hanging up the phone, he reveals to Marvin that Hedy is still alive. Hedy's death was faked to allow Marvin to feel safe in his relationship with Red, knowing he's been caught. Marvin finally reveals the truth. According to him, he's always been loyal to Red but not to Liz. He didn't think Liz was worthy of being Red's successor, that's why he killed Elizabeth. It was Marvin who gave Liz the capsule for her headache. He was responsible for framing Cooper. He shows Red a live stream video of Mirsa with a sniper pointing gun at her. If anything were happened to him, Mirsa would be killed, so Reddington has no other choice but to let him go. You. You are the one who showed me the way. Those recordings you left for Elizabeth. The 21st episode begins three years in the past, with Marvin watching Red craving Elizabeth's death. Only the lonely. Throughout the episode, we see flashbacks of Marvin and Tyson plotting to take Liz down so Marvin can become the boss of Red's empire. Later, Marvin visits Van Dyke and offers Liz up as a way to get revenge on Red for killing Neville Townsend. In the present day, the task force has been ordered to find Marvin. Red wants to kill Marvin, but Cooper still needs him to clear his name. Red explains to Cooper that Marvin knows too much about his organization, which is under threat of collapse. Demby asks Cooper to help protect Red. He organizes a meeting with big players in Red's business to meet at a cabin Marvin doesn't know about. But unfortunately for them, Marvin has bugged Red's vehicle and knows where they will be. He calls Henrik Fiske, the head of assassin operatives, to take out Red. Red meets with his business partners to go over the situation with Marvin. He tells the group that he needs their commitment and loyalty. They are ambushed by Fiske's men. All people in the cabin are dead, except Dambi and Reddington. But the FBI arrives in time and saves both of them. Red knows a guy who works for Fisker. 
They track him down and torture him into revealing where he's meeting Marvin. Demby tells the task force where Fisker is, but refuses to reveal Marvin's whereabouts. As Marvin is on his way to meet with Fisker, he calls Red and taunts him for almost getting killed. Suddenly, there's Red, right in front of his former lawyer. Marvin confronts Red for choosing Liz over him to run the company. But Red tells Marvin he was always meant to be a follower, never the leader. The task force tells the airport to go on high alert, causing everyone in the airport to go into panic mode. Marvin takes the opportunity to escape from Red. Realizing Marvin got away because of the task force, Red calls Cooper and terminates their working relationship. You've lost me, your most important friend and ally. The 22nd episode, which is the finale, picks up where the previous episodes left off. The task force quickly traces Marvin to a private plane in an other airfield where they arrest him and bring him in for questioning. Red, however, is upset with the Bureau for taking Marvin in. Marvin asks for his own task force, arguing that he has all the same resources as Red and his team, but is more reliable. They reach a deal resulting in all of Cooper's charges getting dropped. The task force must do whatever it takes to keep Red away from him. Marvin waits at the jail, which houses other high-profile villains. This includes number 84 on the blacklist, assassin Wu Ying. He has a plan to escape, but needs legal advice on how to be taken to the courthouse. Marvin provides him with the help he needs. Believing that Marvin is working for Red, Wu Ying asks for Red's help out of the country. Instead, Marvin tells him that Red was the name who put him behind bars in the first place. He provides Wu Jing a list of the blacklisters that Red had helped the FBI put away. Wrestler takes Marvin to the courthouse to close this deal. Meanwhile, Red manages to enter the judge's chambers where he waits for Marvin's arrival. Wrestler and Marvin arrive at the office and Marvin enters the judge's chambers alone and find that Red is waiting for him. Red tells Marvin that he will never take his place in power. He says that Marvin will never escape from him. Marvin is freed, but is haunted by Red's threats and takes his own life. Panabaker tells Cooper and Red of Marvin's death and says Red is back as the FBI's informant. The task force meets up at Liz's grave on her third death anniversary. The season ends with a determined Wu Jing who aims to kill Reddington. Oh, we're not going home. Not until I find and kill Raymond Reddington. We won't have to. I have a list of others who will be glad to join the fight. So what are your thoughts about The Blacklist Season 9? What will be the future of Raymond Reddington in Season 10? Tell us what you think and subscribe to the Cine Wizard for more amazing content.